Welcome to End of Life University YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me today. And please remember to subscribe down below to this channel. You'll get notified then whenever I post a new episode, which is usually at least every week. And here you'll find archives of lots and lots of interviews I've done in the past. You'll also find my other podcast, What Really Matters Everyday Spirituality. Those episodes are posted on this channel as well. And I have playlists which divide up into various topics, all of the conversations I've had before. So if you're looking for something particular, like grief or funeral planning or something, you can go to the playlist and it will show you all the episodes that have been recorded in the past about that particular topic. Today, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with novelist John Byrne Barry. And it was really fun. I'm a, a would-be writer myself. I, I'm trying to write some fiction novels, not being very successful. But I was really interested in talking with John about his writing process and the novels that he has written. And the one we're talking about today is titled, When I Killed My Father, An Assisted Suicide Family Thriller. So this is a very relevant topic here to issues we deal with at End of Life University. And I think you'll find it fascinating, something a little different for us today. So here we go with my conversation with John Byrne Barry. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, John Byrne Barry. John is a writer, designer, actor, pickleball player, and crossing guard. He is the author of When I Killed My Father, an assisted suicide family thriller, which is fiction, but is informed and inspired by his family's personal journey with their mother, who died in 2018 after 10 years of dementia. When I Killed My Father is John's third novel, and it's called A Page Turner with a Conscience, about a man caught between what is compassionate and what is legal. And you can learn more about John and his very excellent writing at his website, johnburnberry.com. So John, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much. I, I, I love the introduction, introduction, although I think I said it to you, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just I just cut a few parts out and moved I know, I know. I'm sure yeah. Probably too long. <laughs> but uh I read your book, your entire uh -huh. book. I was really fascinated by it and really enjoyed it because I, I don't very often have a chance mm -hmm. to interview fiction authors mm -hmm. on this podcast. So it's something new for me, but your book was so interesting and so compelling for me to read that I thought, what a, what a great discussion to have with you. So would you start by just telling us all what led you to writing a novel about assisted suicide? Well, you, you, mentioned some of that in the introduction. My mother had dementia for about 10 years. It got steadily worse. And uh, I had been writing other books at the time. And uh, our process with my mother went pretty well. I have four siblings. Um, and all of us and our spouses communicate pretty well together. And we had a lot, number of conference calls and visits and and all that. I, I, I live in California. My mother was in Chicago, but I went back about four or five times a year for many years. And somewhere along the line, I thought, well, what, what if this situation was happening and there wasn't good communication? And instead of not much conflict, there was a lot of conflict because one of the, one of the um, pieces of writing advice I remember from way back in college is what you want to do with your protagonist is get him stuck in a tree and then throw rocks at him or her. So um, I thought, thought, well, what if this situation, if I, if I were to fictionalize the situation, how could, I make, how could I make it interesting? Well, you create a lot of conflict. And in, in this case, you know, someone is doing something illegal. That never came up. I have, to, I have to say to people all the time, this is not a real story. This is a made up story, um, but it is inspired by uh, the experience I had with my mother. And I, I got a little window into the end of life world uh, my mother was never in hospice, but she was in a memory care unit, and we we spent a lot of time in in doctors' offices and and hospitals and things like that. And so I got a a hint of that world that I know you're much more familiar with than I am. Um, and then uh, and then it be, once you start once I start imagining a different world, then it just sort of takes off from there. Interestingly enough. I wrote a first draft before I did a lot of research about the end of life world because I didn't want to be too 
influenced by, I didn't want to copy things and plagiarize other people. Um, and then at a certain point, I, I read certain, reread certain things. I don't know if you're familiar with the Anna Quinlan book, One True Thing. Mm, yes. Many, many years ago, but it's a similar type of story. And I'd read it decades ago, but I didn't read it again until I finished the first draft. And then I interviewed a bunch of people. And because I wanted to, even though it's made up, I wanted to have a sense of this, this could happen, that this is based on, it's not a fantasy world. It's, it's based on the real world. Um, and that's sort of the way I approach, you know, all my books is uh, I make them up, but I want them, I want people to think, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That, that rings true. They're, they're stories about real issues that people really are faced with today. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. we should, we should, at this point, maybe you could just set up the book a little bit. I don't okay. want you to give too much away. People oh, no. definitely should read it because it's very compelling and a great story, but you well, can set you. up the book. The, the, the premise is simple enough. Um, the protagonist is, is a psychologist named Lamar Rose, and he has actually spent some time in the end of life world in the sense he worked and volunteered in a hospice. And that's part of his backstory. But his father um, gets cancer and dementia and says to his son, you know, I want you to help me get, get me out of here. I want you to help me end my life. And Lamar refuses, you know, no way. But his father keeps pushing. And, you know, sort of the, the this is, this is my, my last wish. You, you, you know, you need to do this for me. And so Lamar does. And then at his father's memorial, Lamar's sister accuses him of murder from a pulpit in the front of the church. And that's pretty much where the story goes, you know, what happens after that. And um, nothing, like I said, nothing like that ever happened in my life. But it, it, once you set up that premise, there's a lot of things that, that uh, go into motion. And you got to deal with the legal system, as well as, you know, there are, I know there's, this is oversimplifying it, but there's sort of two camps. One is the sort of pro-life camp that is against euthanasia, against assisted suicide, against all these medical aid and dying laws. And then there's the sort of death with dignity camp. And I sort of created versions of those that lined up between this, the two siblings. So they essentially were fighting a public fight with all these other people. And in many ways, they were pawns. In some ways, they were pawns because they, were, they weren't doing these things, either of them, to win a political point they were doing it because it was personal and uh the daughter had a challenging relationship with her father and you know he she she couldn't uh, she wouldn't have agreed to um what lamar did if he had talked to her about it so he didn't talk to her about it which is in many ways the moral of the story which is that you should talk about these things mm -hmm. and you you probably have dealt with many of these conversations where people disagree right about what should be done. Totally, totally, especially amongst family members yeah, and yeah. siblings often disagree. Right, right, yeah. Um, now, this is a little more extreme. Most of the time, people disagree about how much intervention to to do as opposed to uh, whether or not to help someone end their life. But uh, I know that, I know it, actually one of the very interesting things um, that happened as I was writing the book, I would tell people about it. And I'm not exaggerating here, at least a dozen people. Now, I don't know how many of how many of at least a dozen people over a period of several years said something to me to the effect of, oh yeah, I helped my father end his life. Or one person I know not very well, who was a doctor said she helped both her parents end their lives. And um, now this is not a, a uh, sample of the world it just but i was surprised and i'm sure and you may know this and maybe you can't even say it, that this type of thing happens more than we believe yes uh, so. yes I, i'm sure that it does i'm sure it does and so mm -hmm. this is a, really a valid issue to to bring up and to look at and um i think I think this this medium of fiction is actually a really good way to look at the issue mm -hmm. because for me personally, at least it allowed me to kind of take a step back yeah. and not get right. emotionally involved myself, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to watch this, what was happening and how it played out between the characters, mm -hmm. uh, Lamar and his sister, and then the other, all the other supporting characters who were, mm -hmm. who were in the book too. And 
It helped me take each one of their perspectives and actually look at how they felt about it and how mm -hmm. the scenario mm -hmm. looked to each of them. And so yeah. it, it occurred to me fiction is a really good way to bring us to a place of greater compassion, perhaps, for, for one another and for how other people might view certain situations. Well, I mean, I'm biased as a fiction writer, but I also believe that even though you're making things up, that you can tell truths with fiction and that you, you're, not, you're not constrained by what is really happening. And the difference between facts and truth is a little bit fuzzy sometimes. Um, sometimes you can uh, tell, tell all sorts of facts, but you're not getting at the underlying truth. So anyway, I, I, also, I also read fiction more than nonfiction. I mean, in terms of full length books, and so that's why I gravitated toward this. I, but many years ago, I wrote a, my first book was a, um, it was called Wasted, a, a green noir mystery. And it was set in the recycling world in Berkeley, California, in garbage and recycling, which is, I'd written some journalism pieces on it. I wrote a piece, like a 8,000 word piece called The End of Garbage. And, and some people said, oh, you ought to write a book. And I, I sort of thought, I don't want to write a nonfiction book. I don't really read nonfiction books. So I ended up setting a mystery in that world because it's full of great themes of rein, sort of reinvention and discarding that which no longer serves us and things like that. Um, so it became a, it was a story instead of a, a nonfiction piece about garbage and recycling, which might have been fine, but it wasn't, it didn't grab me as much. And well, you're a great fiction writer, I will say. You. Uh, you write really compelling characters and the plot and story moves along mm -hmm. so well that it was really enjoyable to read as much as it was about a, a subject that is uncomfortable, mm -hmm. that I mm -hmm. not necessarily, um, not necessarily an easy subject, but, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a somewhat confrontational. But again, because it's fiction, um, there's always this opportunity to step back and say, these aren't real people, but this is a real issue that mm -hmm. people deal with. And that, that's really helpful to mm -hmm. get you through the story and to actually hear all of it and take in everything that's happening, having that, that little buffer <laughs> of, of story. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because it, it, it was a hard to write at times. And, and there were times where I stepped back from it because of the subject matter. And, you know, I, in many respects, I mean, I wanted to write something entertaining, but I wanted, I, I wrote it because I feel as if it's important for people to be able to talk about and you know, just acknowledge death. Uh, I don't need to tell you that, you already know that. <laughs> but um, many people, even people in sort of enlighten, the enlightened bubble that I live in aren't really ready for it. One of my close friends went, came to my book launch and bought my book and still hasn't read it couple of years later and he just says i'm just not that interested in reading about death now i think he'd probably enjoy it there's it's, it's not it's not somber or dark in a way but there's some elements of that um and i think that uh uh it was therapeutic for me in the sense that i believed intellectually that it was important to talk about death but that didn't mean that it wasn't still hard for me emotionally to have that. So the process of writing about it and talking about it now over, over a number of years, now I feel much more comfortable talking about uh, my mother's experience, the, 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 the fictional world that, and all that. And so I guess I, I, maybe I did this to help heal myself, so to speak, mm. um, uh, or grow, grow myself. Uh, but there were times when, yes, it was, it was a challenge to, uh, to do it because even though I totally accept the idea that we're all gonna die and it's a very important part of life, I also spend a lot of time trying to exercise and eat right because I don't wanna die anytime soon. <laughs> so. Exactly, well, which is healthy. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, 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 right. right. Um, uh, yeah, I know I'm gonna die, but let's put it off a little longer, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people ask you this um, when they read the book about, are you personally, did you write the book to be an endorsement for assisted suicide? I didn't come away from it with the impression that you did, but I'm sure people always ask you that question. Yes, and, and it, it, it's a tricky one. No, I mean, I, I'm not even sure what I think about that. I do support the 
laws like California has, and there's about a dozen other states have the medical aid in dying. But that's where a doctor, you know, is involved in the process, and it's it's actually it's sort of an arduous process, as far as I understand. Um, but as far as as uh, euthanasia, I don't I, I don't have an opinion, a strong opinion, one way or the other on that. Um, what I do have a strong opinion on is that this is something that we should talk about and that we shouldn't bury it under the rug and that our society um, would be, as a whole would be healthier and individual families that go through this would be healthier. I'm sure you've had this experience where, uh, where families that have already had the conversation before they get to the situation where they're with you are in a better place than those who like are just facing it for the first time. Uh, so that's sort of what I was thinking is let's, if there's any message in the book is not, you know, let's off people when they want to get off, but let, let's talk about these things so that, that uh, we are more comfortable when the difficult decisions come up. And uh, interesting though, I'm in a, I live in a place called the Tam Valley, Tamalpais Valley, right north of San Francisco. And we have a community services district that does murder mystery dinner theater. Um, every year. And I've been in about nine of the murder mysteries as an actor. And I wrote one of the, one of the, uh, the plays. Um, and I was, I did, I did one of the readings at one of the, this place called the cabin, right? Not that far from where I live. And I asked the community service director, the recreation director, I said, well, maybe you guys could co-sponsor it. She said, well, you know, euthanasia, it's, it's such a challenging subject. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, she's right. But every year, we co-sponsor, she sponsors a murder mystery. So <laughs> euthanasia is controversial, but murder, we just accept that as because part of our culture. Yeah. yeah. Murder, so I think that's, hear about that, that every day. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it, the thing is that in my book, there is a killing, but it is done from a place of compassion, not hatred or vengeance or whatever. And most murders, usually someone is not doing it from a point of compassion. It's usually because they want to, they hate someone or they want money or whatever, whatever. Um, and in fact, Lamar doesn't want to do it. No, he, no, he doesn't, he doesn't do it. feel good about it or want to do it. But his father's pleas and requests kind of break his heart open, really. And mm -hmm. it's almost as if he doesn't have a choice. He feels like he has to do it, right. even though he doesn't does not really want to take that step. Right? Well, I, I'm always attracted as a reader to sort of moral nuances. And one of my favorite authors is John Le Carre, who, who writes spy fiction. And I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff. He's written about, a, he died a few years ago, written about 30 books. Um, but it was, a lot of them were set during the Cold War and US versus Russia or British, Britain versus Russia. And the, some of the old school spy things are very much black and white. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And his were always like, uh, maybe not. Maybe some of the good guys aren't so good, and some maybe some of the bad guys aren't so bad. So that kind of uh, that kind of thing attracted me. Attracted me, and that's why I wanted Lamar to be in that situation. And his sister too, the one who accuses him, she thinks she's in the right, but she's got her issues as well. And I start off making her pretty unsympathetic, and I hope that by the time the book is finished, she's a little bit more sympathetic because you see where she's coming from too. She's not doing it out of, you know, uh, a bad place as much as hurt and, and her, her various wounds. Yeah, so. in fact, what comes through is all of these characters are hurting. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and you see, sometimes we get into just painful situations in life. Yeah. And especially we see it all the time working in hospice. Sometimes there isn't, there, isn't like one great solution and one bad solution. Everything right, right. seems gray and there are reasons to do or not do a lot of different things. Right. And that's what we have to grapple with in that moment. And right. how do we come to terms when there isn't really a clear right or wrong mm -hmm, way to go? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just on that note, one of the things I, I wish I could always think whenever I'm having a hard time with someone, someone's being difficult, I try to remind myself that there it's coming from a place of being hurt most of the time because people aren't naturally mean 
they they they're mean because well maybe some are but most people aren't they're coming from a place of woundedness so and and you portrayed this brother sister relationship really well because i wanted to go a little bit deeper it isn't just that philosophically they have different ideas about what's right or wrong or how to help their dad at the end of life but but there's deeper conflict which makes sense in every family that exists sibling conflicts and mm -hmm. old wounds that have been present mm -hmm. since childhood and competition over their father's attention yes right, and right, right. Uh, and so you portray that really well and also how those conflicts interfere with the brother and sister actually communicating well right, about what's right. happening so, but, yeah, so yeah. talk about that well i didn't um i don't know how much this impacted I, i'm the oldest of five and the next one was was my sister and so uh i'm my three of my grandparents were alive when i was born and I was allegedly, I don't remember it, you know, the apple of everybody's eye when I came along. And then my sister was born a year and a half after when I was a year and a half and then came a brother, another brother. And so I went from being the center of attention to just being one of five. And I'm sure that that, that has had some impact on my psyche over the years. And my sister also, as many girls do, grew up faster than I did. So when, 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 she, when I was, 15 and she was 14, she was already much more mature and worldly than I was. So that was another dynamic that played along. But I don't, I think that because that was a long time ago, I don't think that played as much of a role in, in this. But certainly, I think that's one reason I find the sibling relationships fascinating is because there's usually, you know, love at the center of it. But it's not, it's not like there's not conflict or, 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 um, competition as well. And those old conflicts sometimes are what they keep us from sitting down and having productive mm -hmm, conversations mm -hmm. yeah. when the conversation is exactly the thing that yeah. would help us alleviate some of and heal some yeah. of these old wounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I really I appreciated how you portrayed that because I've seen it so many times mm -hmm. in end of life situations where siblings don't agree on how to handle healthcare issues for a parent and they have no context in which to discuss it. And, and part of that happens, I think, because the parent didn't do a good enough job of conveying their thoughts and wishes to both children at, at an earlier time. Well, yeah, and I also think that there's there, there are everybody grows up in a family where dealing with difficult conversations is handled in a different way. And um, I think I'm sort of I was pretty fortunate in my upbringing. Um, but there was still a certain amount of you know, we don't talk about those things here, uh, but not as much as in, in other families I'm become familiar with where it's just the, the, the expression of anything vulnerable was just not done. So uh, yeah, I think that's a, a big part of it is that it, it's, it's not like people don't talk as much as they don't talk about the hard things and they don't, when, when there is disagreement, do you just put it aside or do you go forward with it? I'm not sure that it's always the best thing to go forward with it, but putting it aside all the time, you'll never, you're never going to find a resolution. Yeah, yeah. So. And it seems to me not to not to give away too much of you know the 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 sub story in the book, but Lamar has other issues going on. He has oh, yeah. other other yeah. things in his life that haven't been yeah. healed. That even though right. he's a psychologist, he hasn't really I, oh. dealt with himself. Well, I, I have a good friend who's a, he's he's not a psychologist but a therapist, a MFCC, and and he's of the belief that you know the vast majority of people who go into that field are doing so because they tried to heal themselves and they just, that's a lifelong thing and they find it very fascinating. And so they want to help other people go through that same process. Yeah. Uh, I studied psychology, but I did not pursue it. It's so, an uh, interesting part of the book, getting to go deep into Lamar's psyche and what mm -hmm. all of these various factors that are playing on him and um, interfering with him making maybe the best choice, though I don't know who's to say. Did he make the wrong choice or not? The book doesn't really judge that, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing is trying to tell a story without 
without making judgments about everything because you know everybody's got their own reasons for doing things some of them aren't very good anyway I, it's really it's really a pleasure to to talk with someone who is re reading the book and thinking about it at this level because you know as a writer you think about these things t way too much <laughs> but you know sometimes i've read the book and she's oh yeah yeah i really enjoyed it and then they're on to the next thing it's like wait a minute tell me more <laughs> So, well, I proved to you I, I did read the book, I but know, then I, I know, actually... I'm just saying that, 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 that I really appreciate that. I, I enjoyed it, and I think a lot of my listening audience would too, because we're a group of people who are comfortable mm -hmm. talking about death and with the idea mm -hmm. of death. And so it's fascinating to, to just to read this fictional story that deals with all sides of a controversial issue in this way. And a, a good thought exercise just for us to work through where would I fall on this spectrum and yeah. what might I do? Well, one thing I didn't didn't realize until after I'd written the first draft and was rewriting it, and that's when I did a lot of research, was just how, how um, much was happening and how big, bigger than I expected, this end of life world was. That, you know, there were hospice doctors and palliative care uh people and um uh podcast radio shows <laughs> etc i talked to lots of lots of people i'm sure you're familiar with many of them conversation project i know the reimagined end of life etc and i just had no idea that there was this it's sort of like if you are um like where i live there's a lot of a lot of uh, bicycling mountain biking road riding and you see it but and I do a little bit, but I'm not part of that world. But this world, the end of life world, was out there, but most of us don't see it because, or we don't see it until we get to a place where you know you have a parent or a loved one in a in a end of life situation. So I was just amazed at how much. And, and the other thing was, you. I'm not saying I thought that people would be different, but the people seemed that I did talk with seems so joyful in many ways. Here it's like, okay, here are people who are dealing with end of life people, but they're so positive. And I suppose it does attract a certain kind of person. You can't be too negative and cynical and succeed at dealing with end of life issues because you're dealing with heavy stuff on a regular basis. But anyway, I was very impressed with that with that world. I didn't really know that it existed because we only got a window of it went through my mom's situation. Yeah, that's it's really interesting to, to hear that for me and the other listeners here, because those of us who are in the middle of this world uh -huh. doing uh -huh. hospice work and palliative yeah, yeah. care work and end of life doulas, we this is what we think about and talk about all right, day right, long. Right, right, and I right. think we're a little bit oblivious to how hidden this world is to everyone else out there. And we're still trying to figure out how do we get people to wake up and pay attention to right, to right. the work we're doing and what we're learning. Yeah, well, I, I did talk with someone, I can't remember who it was, who was doing um, presentations at high school. And, you know, I, 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 I'm sure that there's plenty of adults who don't give much thought to it, but just the high school kids, the last thing many of them are thinking about is the end of life. Oh, that's long, long ways away. But I do think that maybe as time goes on, we will get, w this will become something that becomes less of a taboo subject and something that uh but but people like you are 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 trying to make that happen yeah definitely and then bringing our worlds together in a way mm -hmm. your fiction world <laughs> and bringing bringing you together with the end of life world mm -hmm. is one of the ways i feel like we we need to kind of cross pollinate our ideas mm -hmm. and i'd love to see more people in this realm reading fiction books and sharing those and talking about them too because it makes sense to me in the general public people might be more comfortable reading fiction than they would be reading an actual account of yeah. of a story like this just just yeah. like i was saying even i was more comfortable reading fiction yeah yeah, yeah. well i mean that, that, that part of it is that, that my goal was twofold one was to entertain and the other was to get people more comfortable with the idea of talking about these issues and i don't think that if it hadn't if, if if the entertainment part wasn't good enough then i'm not sure people would be doing the talking so you know you had it's that's how you got to do it and, and yeah. that's how i try to approach all these things i read a lot of 
uh, thrillers, you know, and sometimes the thrillers are just, I read one recently uh, where there were probably about 40 deaths and they were all, you know, just killings, bodies piling up, someone shooting, shooting away off something. And I, I sort of get tired of that, but I kept reading it because every chapter ended with like, okay, what's going to happen next? So I tried to use those techniques without without a high body count, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. And it is a page turner. I mean, yeah. literally, I, I couldn't stop reading it. And right. uh, <laughs> but also you do delve into the harder issues. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that so much because like you, um, I, re I really feel sad when I, I read fiction or see movies and they don't even, there's so much killing and death and they don't even that's deal right. with, they, with they, the they, reality they don't deal of with that. Grief, they don't deal with it, it's just it's just a story element it's almost like cartoons like in cartoons you know the, the 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 person dies and then they sort of miraculously come back because they're not really dead but um yeah i mean i think that's that's what i don't like about a lot of the even the best selling what i call the mindless thrillers it's just they're 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 thrillers without a conscience so, so to speak <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, I want to, I just, I do want to praise you again, because not only did you address the death <laughs> and all the issues around it, but you did a really good job of addressing it. And so that's the other thing. I, it feels real to me, the mm -hmm. characters that you wrote and the issues that come up. But I know you mentioned to me that you went to a death cafe or, and I was oh, yeah. really curious about that. Well, um, I've been to, I've been to, uh, two and a half of them, I guess. Um, Anyway, the, uh, I, this was during the process of writing the book, I think I'd already started. And, and um, it was at a Buddhist retreat center in, in Fairfax, which is a, about uh, 10 miles from here. And it was just, what I was uh, impressed by, you know about the movement, right? This mm -hmm. was founded by this man in England um, who, who, who subsequently died. And at the time he founded it, he wasn't sick, right? As far right, as I know. that's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, was, but it was just, it was just people sitting around table and sharing their stories and everybody's got some death related story most of the people there was a very self-selected group though i mean almost everybody there had some had something to say and uh it was the first one was hosted by a man who was had a terminal disease and he seemed fine but he he had a death sentence essentially and he was very he had a very i wouldn't call it light attitude he had a good sense of humor about it but he he was also just this is why I'm here because this is something that that I've ended up talking about a lot. Anyway, so I went to, I went to another one, and then there was a third one that um, there was some problem with the venue, and we ended up having to move. Long story, but I, I thought I I was really I think that what's great about that model is that it, it they were free, open to the public, and it was an entryway for people to explore these issues as opposed to waiting until you're parent or loved one has a has a terminal disease and then all of a sudden you're you're flung into it oh, by the yeah. way since i since i uh wrote the book my wife and i have done a, a trust with all of our end of life papers so um, it, was, it, was, it, it made me realize how important it was to get those things and answer the questions like okay what do i want if i'm you know in a coma and um uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I basically said, I don't want someone to come in and kill me, but just don't do anything heroic measures on. Exactly. The opposite end of the spectrum. And I'll, we can revisit this later, too. If, if my mother-in-law is 99 years old, so they're, I'm not sure I want to live that long, but uh, maybe I will. So. Well, so that's a, that's an excellent lesson that you want readers to take away from the book, too, is the importance of of really thinking about what you want and what you care about and what matters to you at the yeah. end of life and putting it in writing or whatever it takes to have yeah. some sort of legal document. Well, you probably know the conversation project, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things I remember from them, I thought was the easiest sort of the easiest starting point. Cause when I've done, when I've done book readings, you know, remember before COVID, we used to do things in public. Yes. Um, <laughs> one of the things I, I, I said was, well, how many people here, believe that it's a good idea to have conversations about end of life issues with loved ones. And almost everybody raised their hand. Now this is where I am in Mill Valley. Um, and I said, well, how many of, have you have had that conversation? And about half the people had. 
and the other half hadn't. So I think that even among places, people who support the idea, they haven't necessarily gotten into it. But the conversation project person I talked to said, okay, well, there's this form you can fill out online. You know, I mean, it's an online. And then you say to your, your daughter or husband or, or whatever, say, I filled out this form. Can you look at it? And that's sort of the, the venue point. It's not, you don't have to say, let's sit down and have a heavy conversation about what's going to happen at the end of life. Anyway, I thought that was a good starting point. And, um, uh, but there's plenty of other starting points, the Death Cafe being one or, or, or reading this book being another. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It is. And what I believe is that we need as many starting points as we can create because people are so diverse and right, different right. things speak to different people. I've noticed too that in popular entertainment, I've seen a number of uh, end of life things in various movies and stories over the last number of years too. So it's it's starting to to seep into popular culture more. Um, there was a uh, sort of a comedy one called the Kaminsky Met Method. Have you seen that at all? Or? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, that, was had, that had some. Good, I mean, two old guys that had some of that stuff too. So yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, maybe I'm more on the lookout for it than I was before, but uh, I don't think that 30 or 40 years ago, there was as much of that at all. And then what's that other one? The the, uh, the two women, uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda. Oh yeah, Frankie. Yeah, they had they had a scene yeah, there. Frankie too, and Grace. Or... Frankie and Grace, that's right. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's getting into, it's moving slowly into popular culture. Yeah, which is a, which is a really good sign mm -hmm. that at least we're beginning to talk about these issues mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. address them together. I, I was going to say one thing, uh, that you included in the book at one point Lamar someone said about Lamar um oh he has a death cult because Lamar was running a death cafe and I I laughed at that a little bit because honestly I have at times I have wondered like what do people on the outside think of people like me I'm doing a podcast all about death uh -huh, and uh -huh. I <laughs> that's what I talk about and write about all the time and that was well, what my career centered talk. around no, that's, but that's your world that's your but world. Like, it is that you do sometimes wonder like how do people look at that and how are they judging those of us who really enjoy this work and who feel wholehearted about doing the work? And so it was, um, it, I don't know, it seemed really fitting that you put it in that someone actually said, oh, he has a death forgot, cult. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> well, it is interesting. I have a very good friend from a long time back who um, who did, did really enjoy the book, but he sort of, well, why are you writing about this? And, um, but my perception is that you know part of it was that there's that a lot of us especially as we're in middle age we start fearing uh death and we don't w one way to to deal with that is to talk about it another way to deal with it is to not talk about it and uh, that was his approach and I, i'm i'm not going to go there so uh, but he did read it because he's a good friend and he enjoyed it all this but he said, why did you write that? Why, why are you writing about death? <laughs> are you part of a death cult? Yes, yes. No, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't use the word cult for me. <laughs> well, um, let's see, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah. Sorry, my mind. <laughs> well, let me just, let me my, just use, I, well, I have some notes here of just think. Let me just you, tell, tell one of the stories that's in the book, because one of the things that Lamar does is tell stories. And uh, I heard this one from, um, from Ram Das on the radio. And it's one of my favorites. Um, and the reason I mention this is because in case people think the book is too heavy or whatever, there's a lot of lightness in it as well. So this is, a, this is, a, this is an old Chinese um, story about a farmer who's too old to work in the fields anymore. And so um, he sits on the porch and watches his children and grandchildren work the farm. And one day his eldest son comes up to the porch with a wooden box. And he says to, he says to his father, father, we have too many mouths to feed get in the box. And so he obediently climbs in the box. The son puts the lid on top of the box and starts dragging the box across the field to the cliff at the edge of the farm. And then he hears this knock. You know, the father's knocking on the box. He lifts the lid up and the father sits up and says, son, I understand what you're doing and why, but I have a suggestion. Why don't you lift me out of the box and throw me over the cliff? That way the box will be there for you when your children need it. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's a very good story. Yeah, um, because yeah, we're all gonna we're all gonna get there sooner or later, and uh, yeah, but we got to be ready for it. So, 
Well, it occurred to me too, in your book, you dealt with probably one of the most controversial issues you could, assisted suicide mm -hmm. or assist, mm -hmm. assisted dying. But in, the, in this case, it was actually, I guess we call it murder, but yep. assisted dying. Perfectly. And so th anyone who's brave enough to read the book <laughs> and address this issue in the book can probably feel more comfortable like, well, I don't have to discuss that issue with my family. All I have to do is talk about whether right. I want to be in a nursing home or not, yeah, or yeah. how much care I want to receive from doctors at the end of life. It almost makes all the other issues seem so much easier to That's deal right. with. That's right. You can you can say, well, I'll draw the line at, at, at helping anybody get out of here. But but other than that, let's talk. Yeah, let's talk about everything well, else. I mean, I mean sure, I'm sure you've dealt with the whole idea of pulling the plug must be you know, excruciating for a lot of people. Uh, how long to keep someone alive when the hope is... Um, and even my, my dad died at 63 uh, of cancer and um, he had been in a coma for several days and then it was the weekend and some new young doc came in and wanted to do, to do all these, you know, oh, we have one, let's try one last thing. And we, we're all like, no, no. But there is the, there was, this was long enough ago that hopefully there's not as much of that. There was this impulse to let's do everything we possibly can to prevent this death. And I don't know, do you think that is, do you think that impulse is smaller than it used to be or? I don't know because I think that's a very human impulse. You know, right, I think right, that's right. almost, it's almost instinctual for all mm -hmm. of us, the, the survival instinct and to want yeah. to stay alive if we mm -hmm. can. So if people haven't thought about the reality that everyone will die, including them someday, mm -hmm. it will happen and they just fall back on whatever's instinctual to them. I think that's uh -huh. where they end up is I just, yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. I don't want to die. I just want to be alive. But when people have taken the time to actually read about it and think about it and even get familiar, even just mm -hmm. going to a death cafe, you get more and more familiar with all these stories about end of life issues and people dying. And it gives you more and more things to ponder for yourself right. about what possibly could happen and, and right. what, how much choice do you have and how many options are there for you? Well, and you know, you know this already, and, and I'm sure that I knew it myself, but by acknowledging that we're going to die, it, there's an opportunity to make our life and our day-to-day day -day life better because we realize how finite it is. We just don't, we, so we don't want to put off till tomorrow something that we want to do, um, I mean, I, that, that's become a cliche, and, but and you, it's another one of those things where you can understand it intellectually, and then you sort of have to slowly understand it emotionally more and more like, oh, that really is true. That really is true. I have a finite amount of time here, and I want to make the best of it. Yeah, and for me, contributions, what, for whatever contributions I can make like working in hospice and then being around death every day really helped me decide, hey, I'm changing how I live right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much time I have, but I want to enjoy every moment and, and make mm -hmm. the most of this life because yeah. it's so clear to me, obviously, it won't last forever and I, and I want to do what I can with it. But it feels to me, if everyone would even go to a death cafe, like we said, or mm -hmm. go visit a friend who's in hospice or go right. talk with someone, right. Um, who's facing death, we, everyone has so much to learn and that experience would be so enlightening for them. Have you, have you talked to some death cafe people? Cause it, I think you just go to deathcafe.com or something and it's on the, many of them are online now. Uh, yeah. So you don't actually have to show up somewhere you, and you can go to one in Australia if you want. Yeah, def definitely. I used to lead an online death oh. cafe myself oh. for a while. For a few yeah. years, I did that. And I've, I've been to many in person. And it's really a wonderful and comfortable place because nobody has to talk if they don't want right, to. You right, can go right. and just listen mm -hmm. and observe if you want to. You don't have to say anything. Yeah. Well, the coffee part I like too. Is, uh, you know, it it's always, always has to be food refreshment. That was one of the rules, right? Yes, yes. And it makes sense, though, because, you know, when we like break bread together, <laughs> eat and drink together, I think yeah. it just instantly makes us feel closer to the people that we're with. Yeah, that's the one downside of Zoom. You know, you, you um, yeah. 
you can you can have you can have the refreshments, but you can't sort of share them. You can't share them. Yeah. Maybe the technology will improve enough that we can do that. <laughs> yeah, we could order something for everyone That's else right, who's going right, to be right, right, in, right. in the group. Well, actually, we did we did that for some retreat I was on recently. We we or, we ordered lunch and and we all got it delivered while we were at the meeting. So. Well, I was, I've kind of been thinking, I mean, sometimes I like to do this with fiction. I like to play around in my mind, like what, how might things have been different in this story? And I mm -hmm. was curious to know if, do you think Lamar could have handled things differently and still been compassionate and cared for his dad well, and helped his dad short of taking his dad's life? Well, I mean, there's two issues. One is, um, I mean, in many respects to me, the biggest crime he committed was not the legal one of killing his father. It was doing so without the conversation or or approval of his sister, who was equally impacted by this whole thing. Um, so the first thing I would say is have that conversation. And if he would have had that conversation, he might have disappointed the father uh, because he probably wouldn't have convinced the sister. But that sort of would have been a, in many respects a better thing to to do um i don't know if somebody asked me i would say no um i mean are we it's a tricky thing you know when when someone asks you to do something and you feel as if that their approval of you is hanging in the balance that's a very tricky thing so like you said before there's some of some of his own wounds were came into play as, as, as the whole thing went as, and i i mean i can i can think about that now but as a storyteller i purposely wanted to put him in a difficult situation so um you know you don't want to make things easy uh for otherwise people won't want to turn the page so uh, oh so i got up and had some coffee and then i then i, <laughs> then I, then I stretched out and read a book and you know okay great life but not interesting for a story yeah, definitely. And it's true. Lamar was between a rock and a hard place, as they say, and uh, didn't didn't really have a lot of choices. Well, he, and, I mean, he did. He did. He, 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 did, he didn't have a, easy choices. And I think that's yeah, what, easy choices. That, that's so. the that's the things are always choices. But but sometimes the, the, the choices are uh, none of the choices are good. Actually, you know, I remember someone saying that about voting. Uh, I'm not going to get in, but just. So no, we have we have we're choosing between two two uh, bad choices. Like, and someone said, "Well, that's what that's what adult life is all about." You know, when there's two, when there's one easy choice, great choice, and one bad choice, it's easy to make that decision. But when the choices are not so great, that's what makes things hard, and that's what adult life is about. Well, children's children probably face that too. Now that I think of it. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's true. Decisions get increasingly complex, it seems, and yeah. there's more and more gray area, and we're stuck more and more with indecisiveness and the struggle of having to choose. But we do live in interesting times. We do, we do. That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, yeah. I was thinking this book would be a really good book for a book club to read together. I don't know if you've... Um, know of any uh, well, book clubs that have read it and just to well, be able to have a discussion about yeah, it yeah um i i i have i have my wife is in a book group and i've nudged a little bit and there maybe i still will but uh but yeah i think it would be great matter of fact i if if anybody listening wants to do a book group i'd be happy to show up on zoom or whatever to to talk about it because you can see i i'm i like to talk <laughs> because it is a great conversation starter uh -huh. and, and particularly because it brings up all of the perspectives and all the issues involved mm -hmm. and and you feel compassion for everyone on all sides and what and what they're going through and so it's it it would be an excellent book just to read together and then sit down and have a conversation about it and that, that's a great idea to have you come mm -hmm. in on zoom and people be able to ask you questions just yeah, like i've yeah. been doing right right, right. <laughs> happy to do that yeah. yeah yeah i mean you know the the uh the writing life itself is not very glamorous you know you sit down and <laughs> sit down in front of the screen and so the talking about it is is uh more fun yeah exactly well somewhat like like podcasting you wonder <laughs> who out there is experiencing right, what right. i just created and put out right, into right, the right, world right. of it That's for sure, yeah. yeah so how would people get a hold of you can they reach well, you through your website yeah my website is john burn Burn. By, by the way i want to tell you one last little story 
johnburnberry.com or johnburnberry at gmail.com. And the, um, the burn is B-Y-R-N-E. But I, I told you I wrote this book about the garbage and recycling world. And one of my friends introduced me at some book reading. He says, John is uniquely qualified to write about waste because two of his three names have to do with how we dispose of waste, burn and bury. <laughs> um, and someone raised their hand and said, uh, John is actually a well-known way of disposing of waste. <laughs> anyway, but, but when you think about human bodies, and getting rid of them, burning and burying are the two main ways we dispose of them. So that's how you remember my name, John, John... Burn Berry. <laughs> but the burn is B-Y-R-N-E, uh, B-A-R-R-Y. And here's the, uh, there's the book right here, When I Killed My Father. Oops. When I Killed My Father, an assisted suicide family thriller. Yes, johnburnberry.com. Um, or just look up When I Killed My Father. It'll, it, should, it will show up. Um, so, and then I think right now, uh, the ebook is 99 cents so you, you can't oh beat wow that. you can't beat yeah. that and i i i'll just say it's it was fascinating and i couldn't put it down so it's a great read especially you know this summertime is a great time to read fiction if mm -hmm. you're traveling or mm -hmm. laying around a pool or something and right. it's very right. compelling it will keep you engaged constantly because constantly wondering what will happen next that's great to hear Thanks yeah. very much. And the characters are fascinating and even the, the supporting characters all, as well are very interesting. Great. Oh, and actually, I went to medical school in Albuquerque, so I really appreciated that. Oh, is that right? The, yeah, right. The, the book, you captured a lot of the culture and even um, Madrid. I've been there a number of times. Uh -huh. Madrid, and on the yeah, yeah. Turqu yeah. Turquoise trail. trail. Yeah. 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 Well, so, interestingly, you know, my, the book before this, where Lamar was a secondary character, Bones in the Wash, Politics is Tough, Family is Tougher. That was set in New Mexico during the 2008 presidential campaign. And believe it or not, I'd only been there, I, I actually knocked on doors during the presidential campaign for about, for less than two weeks. But I took the bus everywhere and I walked around town and, and I, I, I probably saw more of Albuquerque than many people who live there do because my job was to knock on doors and talk to people. Um, and, uh, you know, I did some research on, YouTube and this and that, but one of the best, one of the most uh, satisfying things was for people to say, to tell me that I captured the essence of it. Um, you, you definitely did. Yeah, uh, that's nice. I, I, I wrote a book about Berkeley, but I lived there for, you know, 30 plus years. So that was a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> even, you know, mentioning the town of Madrid, which when mm. I saw it, I thought, I wonder if he's going to, I wonder if he's going to mention how it's pronounced. <laughs> and, oh, didn't, didn't and, I, and you so. did. Yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. And so I thought you were, you did your homework. <laughs> yeah, well, I spent a lot, I spent some time there too. And that's a, that's a very interesting place just by itself. Uh, for those, for those of you who don't know, Madrid is a former ghost town that uh, was a mining town in the early early 20th century and then sometime in the 50s and 60s uh, you know the hippies and artists started repopulating it and now it's sort of a tourist place with artists and, and but it's over it's it's not exactly off the grid but it sort of feels that way like the place where outlaws and 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 people who don't fit in elsewhere live and so lamar was an artist was an artist yes 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 yeah. and writers, so lamar spent some time there and and uh um, that was a fun place. I, I, I got, got to go back there. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for talking with me about it. I really enjoyed it. It's really yeah. fun to uh -huh. talk about fiction. Like I said, I haven't really mm -hmm. had conversations about a fictional book before with mm -hmm. an author. So it was really fun to talk That's to right. you and to just let the audience here know about your book. And I hope a lot of people will buy it. I hope so too. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's been really yeah. fun talking with you. Yeah. And, well, and, yeah. and, and, and really, I, I also want to applaud just the world you're in and the work you're doing because that's that was the the one of the side benefits of writing the book was was my appreciation of of how how much people like you are doing to spread the word about uh, you know a more healthy approach to living and dying. So. Thank well, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for taking the time to get to know our world and having the courage mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> to come into our world and write about uh, it in uh, such a in such a great way. So okay. well, take thank care. You. Good luck with whatever your next project is. Okay, I'm writing about housing, affordable housing. Next. Oh, oh, great topic. Great uh -huh. topic. All right. Thanks very much. You're Bye -bye. welcome. Goodbye.
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John Byrne Barry about his novel, When I Killed My Father, an Assisted Suicide Family Thriller. I really enjoyed talking to John about the novel and how he wrote it and learning how he made the decision to address such a controversial issue in his novel, because I myself am very interested in fiction writing right now, and I have a novel that I began a few years ago that I've let flounder. But this interview has inspired me to want to get my novel out and start working on it again, because I do think fiction can be a great way to explore issues that might feel too uncomfortable in real life to look at for us. And this book of John's, I really enjoyed reading it. But to be honest, it made me uncomfortable at times. But it's just a fictional story. And so it helped me walk through the discomfort and look at the issue from multiple perspectives. And I think that's really important for all of us to be able to do that. So if you feel intrigued, I hope you'll get a copy of the book and read it for yourself so you'll understand exactly what we're talking about here in this book. And I want to remind you, I'll be back next week with another new interview for you every Monday. I show up for you here, and I appreciate everyone who has shown up for me as a sponsor for this podcast, whether through Patreon or buy me a coffee or just making a donation on PayPal. So thank you very much. Remember, I have a YouTube channel as well. If you like watching videos, you can go to End of Life University channel on YouTube and watch the interviews taking place there. And also, I appreciate those of you from YouTube who have been supporting my channel as well. If you enjoy the content, be sure to share it with other people who might like to listen in. And you can show them where to find it and how to subscribe on whatever podcast platform they have available to them. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do and leave a rating and review for the podcast as that's very helpful as I'm trying to grow the audience for this podcast. So until we're together next week, remember, we're here for love. That is the true focus for our existence here. So face your fear. That's how you find your way to greater love by rising above fear. Be ready for whatever life might bring you next and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.